Now concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, this is the subject that we are going to be discussing and getting into in the coming videos and studies that we're doing on the book of 2 Thessalonians, uh, continuing, progressing through the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and the great mystery of the coming, the presence of the Holy One, the appearing of the God-man, the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ and the manifestation of the sons of God, that which all of creation is groaning and travailing for, according to the epistle to the Romans that Paul also wrote. But this is a great mystery, and God has concealed these things, hidden the truth of his word from the wise and the prudent, so that you have to become as a little child. You have to become as a little child to enter in, to understand, to discern the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so it requires us to become poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It requires us to get very low and humble ourselves and submit ourselves to the spirit, to the teaching, to the anointing of God. We have an anointing. You have an anointing, brother, sister, from the Holy One, so that it isn't according to him that gives all of his time and attention just to study, but it is unto him who draws close to the heart of God and determines to know the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ through prayer, through supplication, through waiting patiently upon him and learning the voice of the Lord, the discernment that comes by the Holy Spirit who unveils the truth of God that's been hidden. Remember that all of the scripture uh, or most of it has been written in parabolic form, types, shadows, symbolism. Uh, there's much that is speaking, spoken of in a very literal sense. And Jesus did teach uh, things that were very literal. It wasn't figurative language. He truly died on a cross. He said, I'm going to go away. And he did. He left his disciples and he was hung on a tree. He went into the earth and was buried in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose again. And he is truly the one who was, who is, and who is yet to come. But there's other language that's figurative. For instance, Jesus said, uh, if your eye causes, to, causes you to be offended, pluck it out and cast it from you. He didn't mean that in a literal sense. Uh, if your hand causes to, to offend you, causes you to be offended, cut it off and cast it from you. Again, figurative speech, speaking of those things pertaining to the spirit because he's working on the heart and the inner man. This is where Christ dwells. When, when Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, this was speaking in figurative terms. So we thank God that we have the spirit today to unveil, to reveal all those things that pertain to to the life of God in Jesus Christ, the God-man, the only mediator between God and man. And so we humbly look unto him and we come to a posture of kneeling down in our heart, in our mind, to receive the word of God that we might be able to walk and even run according to the grace of God that he has given us toward the prize, the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus, so that we don't waste our energy or our efforts, but every way that we move is directed by the spirit of the living God. And we know, according to God's promise, that if we get off base and we go astray, that the Lord is very gracious and he'll leave 
the 90 and 9 and come after and, and cause us to come back into the fold. But we don't want to get off base. We want to stay in the plan, in the purposes, in the will of God, in the understanding that comes from the wisdom of the Lord. So we have to stay in a position where we're very meek, able to learn, able to be taught those things that are pertaining to the Spirit of God. We're speaking of what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. We'll read that. This has been interpreted so many different ways, but we trust that God will give us interpretation according to the Spirit. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all might be condemned, or they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness." But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved you or has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. And right at the beginning here, let us start in the ending. We need to be in a position where we maintain our peace in all those things that God gives us. We seek for wisdom. We seek for understanding according to his plan so that we can walk with him in peace, not warring against his purposes, not warring against his judgments, but welcoming the judgments of the Lord, knowing that the goodness of God turns people towards repentance. And that, of course, includes his righteous judgments, his correction of the situation or of people, of individuals. Has he not corrected us? I know that there's been a lot of work that's taken place in my life, and, and yet there's still much to be done because I don't see myself fully measuring up to the standard that I see in Jesus Christ. But I know that he who is faithful, who has begun this work in me, will complete it to the end, to the day of Jesus Christ, to the day of the full manifestation and gathering together of all the saints unto him. Well, as we look at these things, we can look at the viewpoints that people have taken as they've studied and tried to understand what exactly Paul was writing to the church. has much to do with the first letter that he had written to uh, the Thessalonica church, uh, which we have some previous videos that we've done. You can feel free to look back at those. We'll leave that in the uh, description of the video where you can find a link to look at some of those concerning the viewpoints of those who study out the scripture. And many take the word of second coming, or uh, really it comes from the second appearing of the Lord spoken of in Hebrews, as a second final coming of the Lord to gather together all the saints in the literal clouds. This has been termed the rapture. And so this scripture as well as 1 Thessalonians 4, is very much tied to that which is pertaining to the rapture. 
and the commentaries that have written on this, uh, some of which you know we've studied and read, they point to these scriptures pertaining to the rapture or the catching away, the 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 uh, rapture of the saints, the rapture of the church, those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ and have made a declaration of faith in this present time, in this present age. Uh, they, their hope is for those that have put their hope in Christ to arise and be taken with the Lord up into the clouds, the literal clouds, and to always then be with the Lord. And then, of course, there's many views concerning the tribulation that's to come upon the world. But if we look back at Paul's letter, just starting in the 13th verse in 1 Thessalonians, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remaining until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Well, somebody had taken either Paul's writing or had written their own letters and begun to deceive the people into believing that all that was written about concerning the coming or the presence of the Lord, the final gathering together, the final manifestation of God through and in his people, which is spoken of in parabolic terms, very much a mystery, the mystery of godliness, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, hidden from even most of the church in this day, because though it was very clear, according to Paul's writings, as well as the Lord, who spoke of his coming in the power of the Holy Spirit, to make the people of God his holy temple, his holy habitation, he said, you see this temple. He said, I'm going to tear down this temple. And he looked, he was looking at the temple that was in Jerusalem, that they were in awe of because of the stones of that temple. He says, I'm going to tear this temple down, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. And they, come, they came to understand at a later time that he wasn't speaking so much about that natural temple, but he was speaking about his body, that he would die on the cross and he would be raised up incorruptible, in perfection, as far as in the body. And that is taking place now, today, in the many-membered body of Christ, who is his body. His body is being raised up to perfection. Very, it's very few of those that are a part of the church, the called out, the ecclesia, can see this, what the Lord is doing. But those who have been given eyes and ears to see, we need the clarity of the Spirit to work together with God and to speak those things that are true, pertaining to the coming, the presence, the working of the Lord, who will transform these vile bodies that they might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And he comes in this day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all those who believe, to open the eyes of the blind that they might see the love of God that he has chosen his creation, to make them his habitation, his eternal dwelling place, to cleanse them by the fire of his presence, by the glory of the Spirit, to consume all of the unbelief, all of the fear, all of the misunderstanding in their hearts and their minds, that they might be a pure people, holy and fully given unto him, a clean vessel for the Lord to appear out of. This is a great mystery, but as we yield ourselves to the truth of God's word, we won't get sidetracked by the many doctrines and teachings of men that cause us to fall back into a position of slumber or perdition, where we uh, become very content 
in our present status or on the other hand, the other side of things become very fearful and afraid that either we've missed something or we're going to miss something because of our own uh, shortcomings, our, our own misunderstandings. God wants us to be sound in faith. He's given us not the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. And he desires for us to walk in the faith of the Son of God so that we can hear his voice and obey his command and do what he has called us to do in our generation to fulfill his word without wrath, without doubt, but boldly continually coming to the throne of grace with our hands lifted up, with our mouth filled with praise, knowing that the Lord has ordained us to be in this specific time for the specific purposes that he has called us unto, and that we would be joined together with all those who have been given the vision of the present coming of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the parousia. Praise be unto the living God. So, we again, we don't want to get sidetracked, nor do we want to fall into those things that are uh, just a certain perspective that would keep us very narrow in our understanding. But we want to see the broad ways of the Lord, the many facets of his working, so that we can be open to his working in every individual, in every perspective. We don't want to limit God. We don't want to put him into a box. That's where so many people in the traditions of religion cut themselves off from the rest of the body because they're not able to receive from anybody else. They have their brand of understanding or Christianity as it were, it is, it's called, and they're not able to receive anybody else, any other further revelation or understanding. But they just circle around the same camp forever and ever. And therefore, they become stagnant as the Dead Sea. There's no more flowing of the Spirit. It becomes dammed up in their heart and in their mind. We want to be freely flowing by the power of the Spirit so that the Lord can carry us into the furtherance of His coming, His understanding. The revelation of the Lord is progressively working in his people. This is a kingdom that is continually continually growing and expanding. But we have to have a mind that God can renew. Be renewed by the spirit of your mind. We do that by holding lightly to the understanding that we have. It doesn't mean that we don't firmly stand upon the foundation. The foundation, Jesus Christ is Lord. There's no other foundation that can be laid other than him. But Paul wrote, take heed how you build upon this foundation because everything that you build with, he's talking about those things that you build in your mind, the concepts. Take heed because everything is going to be tried by fire. Those things that are of lasting substance, the gold, the silver, of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. They're going to be able to make it through the times of purging and testing. And that's everything that's built upon that rock that is true and sound. But everything that is the wood, the hay, the stubble, that's not of sound understanding. And people will say, well, the doctrine doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter. Because if your hope is in false, vain things, and you rest back assuming that there's no requirement on your part and you can just live as the world does. And you're not sanctified, separated unto him by the Spirit. Then you're going to miss out on many of the blessings of his using you. Uh, his moving through you is based on your faith in him and trust in him and a your ability to obey his voice because you hear his word and understand it. And all you're getting, get understanding. Praise God. So it's a good thing to search these things out. And if we look at the views of these scriptures, there is a view that is called the preterist view, if I'm pronouncing that right. And we've spoken about this uh, concerning the coming of the Lord in judgment, which was very much fulfilled.
from a literal historical standpoint in 70 AD when the armies of Titus came in and decimated that natural temple and city. But this can be taken to an extreme viewpoint where all of the scripture, including the book of Revelation and everything that is prophetic, is believed to have already happened in history with no further hope of a manifestation of these things in any future sense whatsoever. And therefore, there are those that teach that all, and this is, you can actually find this uh, even in Wikipedia, that his, a lot of the historians, uh, historical theologians, stand in the position of the preterist view. And it really is, I mean, you can look it up on Google, uh, Merriam-Webster. It, it is a Christian belief that interprets some or all Bible prophecies as events that have already happened in history. Preterists believe that the prophecies in the Bible about the end times have already been fulfilled. The term comes from the Latin word praetor, meaning, which means past or beyond. This is becoming very popular in our day. And a lot of it, it culminates in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But you can see this is not something that is new. This has been around for a long time. And when it can become a little bit one-sided or extreme is when there's no longer any room left for God to fulfill his word in a future sense. You can see much of this has been written back in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. Well, and then, of course, we know the extremist position on the opposite side would be everything being a futurist. Everything, all of prophecy or the majority of it written about in even uh, the books of First and Second Thessalonians, Revelation, a lot of those things that pertain to biblical prophecy have not been fulfilled at all yet. It's all futurist. It's all to be done at a later time. And the timeline, of course, we can see, obviously, especially when it pertains to the things of the rapture, those things that are termed the rapture, they're always having to move the date because someone will come along and predict according to their understanding by the word of the Lord or by divine revelation the times and the dates of when Jesus is supposed to come in the rapture, and then it isn't fulfilled, as they say. So they keep moving the timeline, the dates. And many people would say, well, if you miss the time again and again, then it's clear that you're a false prophet. Nevertheless, many people uh, listen to these teachers and continue to put their hope in a futuristic event of the coming of the Lord, of the great tribulation, of the appearing of the Antichrist or the manifestation of the Antichrist, and on and on and on it goes. And then again, the preterist view takes all that and puts it in that past. However, there is a balanced approach, which I think we that are looking for the unveiling of Jesus Christ, if you believe that everything in Scripture has already been fulfilled, then I'm afraid we're forever stuck in this cycle of life and death because no one has put on incorruption in the body. And that is a promise. You go through the scripture, the promise is eternal life, even in the body for these bodies to be transformed. And it's written of both in Philippians and also in second uh, Corinthians or first Corinthians, the 15th chapter, that this corruptible body must put on incorruption and that we all will be changed. Those that are the first fruits, they're just the first in order, the first in God's time and plan to have their bodies changed. Some have their hope, as far as a futuristic view, in the rapture. Others, in the manifestation of the sons of God. But regardless, we know that there's something yet to be done. Because people are still dying, even though th those that have all of their hope in Christ, they're still laying their bodies down in death. And that has to be overcome. That's the promise of God. They that overcome will be granted to sit with me in my Father's throne. Well, we have to overcome every enemy, including the last enemy, which is death. So while I can see clearly that a lot of the Scripture has been fulfilled in a historical sense, at least in that natural view. And the word of God can 
meet us at many different levels of understanding. And it's so wonderful that God is able to speak to us and we can see it worked out in natural terms. But then there's also something deeper many times that's to be fulfilled in a spiritual way uh, that is spoken of in symbols and types and shadows. We can see it all through the scripture. For instance, there was a promise that was given uh, to the patriarchs that Israel would go into bondage for 400 years and that then they would be brought out of Egypt with a strong hand so that the scripture could be fulfilled that out of Egypt I called my son and you can actually find this verse in two places both in the Old Testament in Hosea in 11 1 when Israel was a child I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son and we see that fulfilled historically, of course, when Israel was brought out of Egypt through the mediator Moses, and God brought his children out with a strong hand through many signs and wonders and miracles. But amazingly, we see it once again fulfilled historically when Jesus was taken by his parents as a young child into Egypt. So we see that same scripture again in Matthew 2.15, that now it was spoken of about Jesus, the son Jesus, who Israel was a type of. The fulfillment was in Jesus the Lord. However, we see it once again fulfilled in all of those who put their trust in the Lord. And this is more in a symbolic form, in a parabolic form, because all of us have come out of the bondage of sin, which Egypt speaks of. God brings us out of that bondage, and we go through the first feast again, symbolically. That feast that they celebrated of Passover was a very literal historical feast, and you can read about it there in Exodus. But we all, in a symbolic form, go through that. Praise God. And there's many that have not yet partaken of that feast of the Lord. They're still in bondage to sin and have no knowledge of their Savior, God, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And they are still waiting as captives to be delivered out of their bondage to sin, out of their Egypt. But the Lord is faithful and he will deliver his captives. Praise be unto God. So we can see that this is fulfilled at least twice in a literal sense, Israel was brought out in Exodus, out of Egypt, out of Egyptian bondage. Jesus was brought out of Egypt after his father, and well, it was Joseph and his mother Mary had taken him into Egypt to hide him uh, during that time when the infants were being killed. And after the time, the period was fulfilled, the angel of the Lord came and said, the, the one that wanted to kill him is now dead. So you can come out of Egypt. And so he did come out of Egypt. And they went to Nazareth and he became a Nazarene. But all of us also walk through that. That scripture is fulfilled in each individual who comes out of the bondage of sin. God delivers us out of our Egypt by his strong right hand. And he brings us into a wilderness speaking parabolically. All of these things are fulfilled so that the word of the Lord, which the disciples asked, why do you speak to the people? Why do you speak to the people in parables? So that Jesus said in Matthew 13, 13, therefore I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will, you will hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of the people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their ears, and hear with their ears, I'm sorry, see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts, in turn, so that I should heal them. And so you see that the Lord has purposely hidden these things from the so-called wise and prudent 
so that he might by grace reveal his word, his plan to those who have been ordained to walk in obedience to the Son of God and to have his life manifested in them. By grace, by grace are you saved. Amen. We're not able to open up our own understanding, our own eyes. Paul prayed that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Who does the enlightening? God does. We speak the word of truth, but if people's spiritual eyes are closed, we have no power to open them up. If their spiritual ears are dull of hearing, we have no power to open up their ears. Only God, by the Holy Spirit, can cause people to see and hear. He's the one that gives life, that all glory might be given unto our Father, who raises the dead. Praise God. So we're going to continue in this. We thank God for the truth of his word. Let us continue together in prayer, seeking the Lord. I feel the call of the Lord to hide away in him, to seek his face, to know him more intimately. And as we know him, he'll unveil to us our position in him, his presence, his coming, his appearing, so that we can work together with him and find our rest in the work, in the peace of the Son of God.